Good afternoon. It's a little bit difficult being the last speaker. I know I'm what stands behind you in lunch, but I can guarantee if you'll stay and listen, I'll give you something to talk about while you're having lunch. My name is Sharon Lagore, and I'm a parent and a grandparent. And I'm here today to talk about my lived experiences of decades of drug abuse and alcohol abuse, starting when I was first born. I was born into the family of alcohol. My father was an alcoholic, as was his father, as was my great-grandfather. I come from a line of alcoholics. And to tell you, as a small child, the trauma and the problems that arose in my family as a result of that alcohol and my father's disease of addiction, that by the age of seven years old, I was hospitalized with a stomach ulcer from all the stress. The doctor told my father, if you don't quit, you're going to kill her. And at that point, my father sought out help and found it through Alcoholics Anonymous. As a matter of fact, that was the first prayer I ever learned was the serenity prayer. And I'm happy to tell you that my father did find recovery through AA. We went on to still attend the AA meetings, and I actually joined Alateen when I became a teenager. You know, I thought growing up, I made the decision and the choice never to use drugs and alcohol. And I thought that that would be enough for my children. And what I learned down the line is that there's a genetic composition, which I didn't hear about today, and we really need to be educated about protective factors and risk factors as family members. You know, I want to focus today, too, on telling you a story about my daughter, Angela. I think her picture's up there, and the reason I brought her picture was to put a face to the disease of addiction. When my daughter first began to display changes in her behavior, I thought it was typical teenage mood swings. But as the changes in her appearance, grades, and friends changed, things became more intense, and new problems surfaced, and I knew I needed help. I didn't know where to go, who to call. I had no idea that I needed education on how to navigate a system. I didn't even know what a system was. And who do you go to? Who do you call? Pick up a phone and say, my child's addicted to drugs. There's such a huge stigma across this country for the parents of those children that are addicted. What did you do to cause it? You know, what are you doing to try to help? Well, I'm here to tell you that this has been a traumatizing and excruciating time for my entire family. Weeks turned into months and months into years, and I had my daughter in 11 different treatment facilities, some for two days, and I was lucky enough a couple times to get 30 days. But no one in all those 11 treatment facilities ever said to me, you need a recovery plan for your daughter. And surely no one ever said, I, I heard you talk, Mr. Fishman, about just having that blockage of letting parents in and telling them what's going on, especially when a child hits 18. And I wasn't aware. I didn't know who to call. And in those rehab sessions, when they told me after two days, after three days, after two weeks, she's well, take her home, I believed them. I trusted it because I was not educated about addiction. I thought just making that choice and telling my children what happened when I was a child was enough of a protective factor. But it wasn't because I needed to be educated. Each time when they told me to take her home, that's what I did. And at the end of four and a half years from the beginning of her addictions and to the end, my 18-year-old daughter was introduced to heroin, a drug that became her only focus in life. 
She told me that having heroin and using heroin was like needing air to breathe. I didn't understand it because I never had a drug or alcohol addiction. I thought you could put it down and quit. I had no concept, and that's where the education piece really helped me. I talked to my daughter on a Friday night. She talked about her struggles with the drug, and she described her addiction again to me. Mom, it's like being in a very deep hole, and I can't get out. I told her, and that this at the time was the only thing I knew, you got to get back into treatment. Somebody beeped in on her call. She said, Mom, i got to go. And we said our I love yous, and we said our goodbyes. And that next Monday, my daughter took her last injection of heroin. 27 hours later, her body was discovered, dumped by a muddy creek where her drug dealer had left her, just like unwanted trash. The next time I saw her, the coroner was walking up my door and handed me a little brown box with all that remained of my beautiful daughter, Angela, just a can of ashes. You know, at that time, nobody said to me, you know, you need to pay attention to your other children. The siblings get ignored. We're not educating our families. Watch out for the siblings. You know, I thought, oh, okay, they're doing okay in school. That must be enough because I was dealing with my own trauma and loss. And it wasn't long after that one of my sons started with the symptoms of mental illness. He went on to addiction, medicating with cough syrup to start with for his mental health issues. He has been diagnosed bipolar schizophrenic, and I've dealt with him for years. I've dealt with a child who goes in and out of the system, but as we've heard prior from people, the justice system, there isn't a setup when they come out for services and all. We desperately need that, and I know the Carroll legislation has a provision in there to work on that. And this is another one of my passions in the prison systems because I've seen it. I've seen my son come out. And even with the people I know and trying to access treatment, I couldn't do it. And I know this is an area that needs to be focused on. And it's one that I will passionately advocate for as well. I just want you to understand that my story is a typical story across this nation. What's happened to me is happening to families across the country in towns, in cities, in communities, in silence. And no family should have to face the disease of addiction alone. Our stories cross socioeconomical levels, race, ethnicity, and religion. It spans generations and intertwines its clutches deep into our children. And it's quickly killing them one by one. In my own county of York, Pennsylvania, the coroner announced recently that overdose deaths rose by over 300% last year. Make no mistake about it, there is an opiate crisis, not just in my county, but in counties across the United States. My question is, if Ebola can bring the country together to focus on a disease, take precautions so that it doesn't spread to our healthy populations and patients are treated with respect and with kindness, and they look for possible early interventions and treatments. And we've lost a few Americans to or had a few Americans succumb to this disease and we were able to cure them. We have one in four families addic that are affected by addiction in this country. So why can't we help those addicted with that same support, that same respect, and treat those families with the whole idea of, you know what, we want to make your family well and we want to make your child well and focus on the entire family, the full continuum of care, 
to go from prevention, which is important to stop this crisis, to intervention, early intervention, to treatment, and follow up with recovery and support services for not only the child that is addicted, that youth that's addicted, but also for the families. I heard a young person say once, we can't take a sick tree out of a sick forest, make it well, put it back in the same sick forest and expect it to thrive. We can't do it. We need to work on the whole forest and that's the families. You know, my daughter tried to change, but she ran out of time. And instead, it was me who would change. I left my job as a dental assistant after my daughter died in 1998 because I wanted to do something. So I got active working on a piece of legislation, a heroin drug trafficking bill, which I'm happy to say was passed in Pennsylvania. And once that was signed into law, I began to locate other families who also had lost children to addiction, and we created Moms Tell, a parent advocacy organization whose mission is to educate, support, and unite everyone impacted by substance abuse and co-occurring disorders. We continue our outreach and partnering with other family advocates, and we were in instrumental in creating a national family dialogue for families of youth with substance use disorders. In 2009, SAMHSA sponsored a meeting in Washington, bringing parents from 34 states and four tribal nations together to discuss this issue around adolescent substance use disorders. The meeting spurred a report from the families members that showed up at this forum, and that created the National Family Dialogue for Youth with Substance Use Disorders report that went out across the country. We made recommendations about the challenges we faced, and we outreached to the government and how can we help as family members. This was a beginning, but more is needed in order to make further progress. We reached out to those families and members in, of both the Moms Tell and the National Family Dialogue and asked them, what is the biggest need that you see identified? Parents need to know that help is available for, for their child. And they said, you can't have parents ready and children ready, young people ready to go in for help and it not be available or know where to be found. As I said, this is a family disease and we can't do it alone. Our family made, members are creating organizations and support groups across this country from organized offices to kitchen tables. But we need financial help as well to continue the support. You know, we also need help with those organizations that are established, like the partnership. I've been a member there on their parent advisory since 2003, and we have shaped the direction, I feel, since parents have been involved to really create that, that joint effort. We have CADCA, who is working with the coalitions, and these, and Faces and Voices of Recovery, we need to join all these forces together and really attack this problem. I reached out to parents, and so these are things the parents said across the country to me that are some of the number one needs. We need to address the fatal heroin epidemic. We need improved policy and legislation, and passing the CARA legislation is a good start. Educate the families about substance abuse issues. And I know our friends at the partnership have taken the lead there by providing good educational resources for our families and actually partnering with us to get those resources out, like in peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support services, which our family said is the number one thing they need, peer support. These programs are doing a great job, but they need additional resources as well. Parents said create a national parent roundtable for prevention, treatment, and recovery. Include parents on the established roundtables and policy tables across the country. Address the stigma problem. One asked, why is there a shortage of rehab beds, but there's never a shortage of jail beds? Incarceration doesn't wor work alone, and getting funding 
to do the programs, as you all heard earlier, giving people life tools. You know, the topic would be a good place to start to include family members on the National Task Force for Recovery and Collateral Consequences included in the CARA Bill. Address further educating physicians and pediatricians, stress management for families and kids, and make naloxone readily available to families and police. You know, we are families in need of healing, and some ways to begin that healing process is to bring to light the needs of families and the ways that we can work together with our legislators, with our researchers, research is critical, with our policymakers, with our advocates, with our young people, and again, with our families, to look at this problem, to come together as a nation and address this issue before we lose any more children. So the members of our families just want to come across with making these suggestions that we get, that we really get working together. Let's address this national crisis of heroin. Let's transform the family involvement infrastructure to provide needed peer-to-peer -peer support services for parents. Let's help improve policies in prevention, treatment, recovery, and with our families, being sensitive to their needs and the needs of our young people. Let's get the word out of a recent um, issued bulletin that was made from the Center of Medicaid and SAMHSA to clarify that peer-to-peer -peer supports may be provided to families of youth with substance use disorders like it is with our families on the mental health side. And last but not least, let's work together to identify the things that will improve the prevention, treatment, and recovery systems and our involvement with families and young people across this country by passing the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act of 2015. Thank you.